All right, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, would you be able to explain the homework we're going to be going over today? Yeah, we'll be going over that today. That was, it was a read ahead section. So. Oh, okay. We'll do it in a couple of ways when we go over that in terms of example 12 and using their algorithm or <coughs> modifying it a bit. All right, so we're going to finish up 4.2. And we're talking about numbers themselves, which are just simply a collection of objects, you know, the cardinality of it, how many do we have, which is just a bunch of ones if we look at it that way, can always be written in AK, AK minus 1, A1, A0, base B, which is an expansion. We have so many groups of B to the K. And we keep on going down until we have so many groups of B squared, we have so many groups of B, and then we have so many ones left over. And we keep doing this form of grouping where the base has to be greater than or equal to 2. Obviously, it's an int. So when we're doing group sizes, we have to do group sizes by 2 or greater. And we group them out by 2, 3, 4, however you want to do it. And then how many you have, the A sub I, are always going to be uh, less than or equal to b minus 1 and greater than or equal to 0. But obviously, you know, when you start off just writing the figure representation of the number, we don't start off with a 0. That's all we say. We, just, we start off with saying, which is the first group that actually has some values in it? And we group everybody in terms. Now, one of the questions is, how do I write things in a base b figure? So if I have a base B expansion like this, how would we write things like, now typically, yes, all numbers are collections of ones, but in our mind, we have been raised up to, to understand that base 10 numbers are what we see as a representation. So when we say things like, well, what if I had, say, uh, 103, which is obviously in base 10, and what would this look like in a base say by, uh, let's just make it base 6, like that. How would I find the figures that represent this thing in base 6? Well, there's kind of two approaches to this. One approach is just the, the obvious create, the creativity approach. If this is in base 6, and I want to find the A0, the A1, the A2, up to the AK, this is going to be how many ones you have. This is going to be how many sixes you have. This is going to be how many 36s you have. And the A3. And so in terms of the group sizes, we have to go through here and ask for uh, the 103. Uh, we'll have groups of ones, group of sixes. No, those will go up. Keep going up here. A3 is group of 6 to the third power. And 6 to the third power is 36 times 6. That's what? 240 minus 4, 20, 24. 240 minus 24, which is what? Uh, 216. Is that right? Is that right? 6 cubed? 216? All right, so we have that 216, and if I would look at this, we would say I'm going to have to go through here and find these group sizes. And we're going to have groups of 1s, groups of 6s, groups of 6 squared, which is 36, groups of 6 cubed, 216. But if I'm only dealing with 103, am I going to have any groups of 216? No. So there's none of that. And so then what we rather do is we start to go here and say, all right, well, how many, if we just try to do this in a creative way, how many 36s are here? Two thirty-sixes would give me what? Seventy-two objects. Uh, what if I had three thirty-sixes? Anybody know like the short way of you know like this idea of three times thirty-six? If you could look at this, sometimes you want to do it in your head. You want to do it easy. What is that? You know, forty minus four, right? One hundred twenty minus twelve, which is what? One oh eight. Right? So I'm obviously not going to get 336s. 
there's all these little things that you guys can learn, like you know, addition by and multiplication by decomposition and factoring and distribution. But so if we would look at that, I'm only going to get two of those. So this would obviously be two of the 36s, but two of those 36s means 72 has been used up. If two, if two 36 means 72 is used, right? So what's left? Thirty-one, right? There's thirty-one left. Now, for the thirty-one left, um, how many thirty-sixes are you going to get out of that? None. That was the whole point of picking two and not three. Okay. Well, how many sixes can you get out of thirty-one? Five. I can get five sixes. So that says, hey, look, I have five. Sixes, which is 30, and then what's going to be left over? One, and that's in base six. So that's kind of doing it in a creative process, right? You say, all right, how many of these, and what's left over? How many of these, what's left over? And you just group it, right? We just, how many groups of 36? How many groups is a six? How many groups of, how many individuals will be left? And so what base expansion tells us is 103 units, right? could be regrouped into two groups of 36, five groups of six, and then one person standing off to the side. All right, that's what base expansion means. Now, creative ways is all interesting and, and as you do it, and you could always easily check. check. Checking is easy. So if you're telling me that I have two of these, if I have two, five, one, and base six, what this really means is I have two six squares and five six to the one and then one. And then you just simply go back and say, okay, what's 72 plus 30 plus one, that's 103, yeah, in my original base 10, right? Now, if I see no parenthesis comma, I will just to simply assume that this is classic base 10. If you're going to be not in classic base 10, you have to have the commas and tell me what your base is. So the parentheses to separate out your coefficients for your figure on your base B expansion. So going from any base 6 up to base 10 is easy. Just simply write down what you have. Going the other way, we could either do a creative process like I just did, or we can just use the fact that what does a base B expansion look like? Say, for example, what if I said that I had say, A3, A2, A1, A0, and base B. All right, that means that I have A3B cubed plus A2B squared plus A1B plus A0. That's my amount in. What do I notice about my first three terms? They all have a B, right? Well, let's factor that B out. Let's look at that for a second. This is A3B squared plus A2B plus A1 times B plus A0. Does that look familiar? Does this look like N is equal to Q times B plus A0, which would be R? I might as well write it this way, R. So if I would see this, I notice that if I just simply group out a B, um, R and the Q are from the division algorithm, right? And R happens to be A0, and the quotient happens to be everything else but missing a B. So this here gives us a process to find the coefficients in an algorithm, right? And so this would be called uh, going through and finding, uh, going from base 10. So if I needed an algorithm, to go from base 10 to base B. 
we just simply do a loop. We would say that, okay, we start off with n, so you're given n, and we're going to simply loop here. And what's my loop going to do? My loop's going to go through here and say, all right, a, let's say from k equals 0, or let's make it not k, from i equals 0 to the end, where what I'm going to form is, let's say, that's, let's call that k, a k all the way down to a1, a0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find these numbers one at a time from right to left. And the way we do that is a sub i is simply equal to n mod b. Because what does the modulus return? The remainder. Now, if I look at the quotient, how do I find the quotient? That's n div b. If I look at the quotient here, that Q, is that already a base B number? Yeah, that's a base B number. And I just need to figure out what it is. Well, how do I do that? Well, it's just loop, right? The modulus of this is going to return the A1. But what's left over is going to be a base B number. And we just simply keep going around. And so we just simply say N is equal to, let's just go back on it in N. Well, how am I going to do this? If I'm going to loop on this, instead of saying from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, when will that occur? You keep going until there's what? Nothing left. We just group and group and group and group and group until there's nothing left. In other words, really what's happening here for this problem, this is a while n is not zero. It's really what's going on. Okay, let's see how that works. We're just going to we're going to keep grouping out a b, and then take the 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 div and then work it out. So all right, let's go back to our problem that we already know an answer to. Uh, one o three. So we already know that one o three in base ten was two five one in base six. We know that. So let's show. Let's use this new algorithm. So what we're going to do is. If I'm going to be using the new algorithm, if I want to take 103 in base 10 and return something in base 6, we will find each of these numbers one at a time. I will start, I'll find the right number and move left. And so we're just going to start off with 103 and we're just going to simply do div mod div mod, sorry, mod div mod div mod div until the div is 0. Okay, so we our start off with n is equal to 103. Uh, what is 103 mod 6? How could you use, a, what's the quick way of doing this on a calculator? There we no way to find the modulus. Okay, what we could do is have 103 things and we keep sharing it and ask what's left over, right? Okay. What we're going to do here, and then I'm going to ask for 103 div 6. We're going to need both of these at the same time, right? So where is the nearest multiple of 6 to 103? How do you know a number is a multiple of 6? An even number that's a multiple of 3. Where is the nearest even number that's a multiple of 3? 102, right? And so I know 102 is the nearest one. So 6 times what gives me 102? All right, so this would be 17, and that would be a 1. Because 103 is equal to 17 sixes plus 1. All right, so now n is equal to? 17. I, I take the quotient, right, and then work on that. Well, then I'm going to do 17, and so what does this 1 do? This 1 goes into that position right there. 
goes into that one on the far right. I might as well write that bigger so it's easier to see. We're going to do some things in base 6. And we're going to take, trying to figure out each of these numbers, then they will be found from right to left. 1 was my first mod. Now we take, okay, what is 17 mod 6? And what is 17 div 6? What's the nearest multiple of 6 to 17? I got that backwards. Why is my head doing this? All right, five, two. And the mod is the next number. Sometimes it'd be useful to keep the algorithm straight in your head. Six to, because 17 is simply two times six plus five. Because we're paying attention to the mods. So that's my next number. Okay, now what's in? And just drop to Q. I mean, <coughs> take the Q. Okay. What is 2 mod 6 and what is 2 div 6? 2. Yep. And that's because 2 is equal to no 6 is plus 2. Therefore, this is my next number. 2. And am I done? Is Q 0? And once your Q gets 0, you stop. And the order of the modulus is that you see. 152 is 251, right? And all this is doing by just, all this is really doing is factoring out a B. You just keep factoring out Bs and you get the, the modulus for each of those. Okay, so this would be an algorithm. What's nice about an algorithm, there's no, how many fit here, what's the subtraction, just do it. Just do a mod div. Take the div, write it over, do a mod div, take the div, write it over, and the mods that you all have are your expansion. All right, so we can go back and forth between each of these. So it's easy enough to go from a base 6 to a base 10, a base 10 to any base, right, like to base 6. This would work for any base at all. Obviously, you need to be good at, what, 2, 4s, 8s, 16s, 60, you know, just because base 60 or base 11. Just do some... You know, when they show up on the exams, I'm going to pick usually some weird things like a 7, 11, or a 5, you know, things like that. Any questions on that technique? And all of these are just to simply get to a figure representation of the number. And again, um, we've always grown up thinking in base 10. If I tell you 103, you don't think 103, usually you represent there's a thing that 103 represents. You have a, a concept of size. 103 pennies. You're thinking of like a dollar bill and three pennies, right? You have an actual representation of the number in your head. But if I'd said, how would you read that 251? You wouldn't say 251, right? Because that's two groups of 100. That's not what you have. You have two groups of 36, five sixes, and one. Right? So normally you would just simply say 251 in base 6. So it's hard, though, if I would tell you, oh, you have 251 in base 6. Hand me that amount in money. And you'd be like, in pennies. And you're like, 251 in base 6 in pennies? I don't have any physical representation. We don't think about it enough. That's one of the reasons why we usually move it into base 10, do some ideas. Now, do we have to move things into base 10 because we're familiar with it? One of the questions we could ask is, if I gave you a base B number and another base B number, could you add them? On the other hand, what if I gave you a base B number and another base B number, could you multiply? In other words, could we find algorithms 
to add and multiply and stay in a particular figure at base. In other words, don't write the numbers, don't go to base 10. Could you go ahead and just simply stay in base B and understand what you're doing? Well, the easiest way to do problems like this is to say, well, there's already things I know how to do. What if I gave you, again, 1, 2, 3, and base 10, and say 7 and 9 in base 10, and I told you to add them. All right, why is it we've come up with the vertical stack method? All right, because what does the 2 and the 7 actually represent? Two tens and seven tens. All right, when you add things, are you supposed to add like things? Yes. All right, I don't say that 7 plus 3 is 10 or 2 plus 9 is 11, right? Those aren't, like, those aren't alike. So when I do this, I have to say, no, 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 I have to add like things. So that's why we stack it vertically. And if I would look at this, I would have, what's 3 plus 9? 12. But how do I write 12 in base 10? That's, so why do I put a 1 on the upper left and the 2 down here in the bottom right? Because it is a group of 10 and 2. That's what 12 is, right? Okay, now if I add that vertically, what do I get? 10, but how do I write 10 in base 10? I have a group of 10 and a 0. Why is it in that position? Because that's actually that 10 really means 10 tenths. So I have one group of 10 squared in an actual position allows me to do the carrying appropriately. And then I just simply add that and I say 2. All right, so that makes sense, right? If I get to a quantity bigger than my base, it groups. And I have to say, how many of these larger groups do I have? All right, let's try base 6. What if I would give you 2, 5, and 4, and then in base, well, let's pick, say, 7. And let's do a, a 6 and 1 in base 7. And I want to add. What's the algorithm? Uh, same. What's 4 plus 1? 5. But how do I write 5 in base 7? 5, because it's smaller than 7. Right? What is 5 plus 6? 11. But what is 11 in base 7? It's 1, 7, and 4, 1s. So that is 1, 7, and 4, 1s. It's doing the same thing, right? We still do the carry, but the, one, the carry represents groups of your base. And now what's 1 plus 2? 3. In other words, what did I just basically say? You know, one of the things you should note is... 5 in base 7 plus 6 in base 7 is what? A 1, 4 in base 7. We should know things like that. It's a group of 7 plus 4 is 11. If you, In your head, you're thinking the numeracy of it. It's 11 objects. And, well, how do I write 11 objects in 7? So that's a 7 and a 4. So is addition pretty easy? Right, you just have to understand the carry concept. What are you carrying? Your base that many of those, and then we just do addition of like objects. Here comes more fun. What about multiplication? What if I had, say, 2, 3 in base 10, and I multiply this by 1, 5 in base 10, and we multiply. Here's the thing. How does this vertical stack multiplication work. When we do it, we're going to show it here in a bit. Okay, what's 5 times 3? 15. So what do I do? Five, one, one. I put a 5 and a 1 over there. All right, what is, but I have to do my multiplication before my addition, right? What is 5 times 2? 10, but I had a 1 carried over, so I actually have 11, but what's 11 in base 10? A group of 10 with a 1 left over. 
and there's nothing, there's a zero, so I don't have to worry about that. Okay, that was my first base 10. All right, then I have a zero here because that's actually a 10 with a no. What's one times three? And what's one times two? And then I simply add now, and that is five, four, three, and so that's 345 in base 10. What if I did the same numbers? 2, 3, and base 4. Oops, I can't do that. Uh, we need to have it be, be base 6, right? I'm going to keep the same numbers. And now I'm going to multiply. The, the thing is, what does this vertical stack actually do? What this is replicating, you know, how am I going to do this? Well, let's look at this for a second. 20 is 2 times 10 plus 3 and 15 is 1 times 10 plus 5, right? I wrote 10, then for some reason I wrote 5 because I'm thinking of 5. Right? That's actually what the numbers are. But those are two terms. So if I, add, if I would multiply this, what would I do? The 5 is going to have to multiply who? the 3 and the two tens, right? It has to be distribution. That is equal to by distribution, so this has to be, I'm going to have to take the 3 times the 5 and add the 5 times the 2 times 10, right? And the 1 is going to have to distribute as well, right? And that would be this 1 times 10 times 3 plus this 1 times 10 times 2 times 10, which I actually I could factor out a 10 out of that there, and that would be 1 times 3 and then 1 times 2 times 10, right? All right. What happens when we do that stack vertical? 5 times 3, 5 times 2. Hey, look, 5 times 3, 5 times 2. It's the first part of the distribution. And I'm eventually going to add, well, then what do I do? Well, the other stack vertical I did was 1 times 3 and 1 times 2. But what is 1 times 3 and 1 times 2? The other stack distribution. So when you vertically did your algorithm for your vertical <coughs> multiplication, what are you actually doing? Distribution. And after you do your distribution, what do you do with everybody? You add them together. So what you've learned is I'm actually using distribution on a positional number which is the base B expansion by 10. Did they tell students that you were doing that? No, but that's what you do. So will it work for base 6? Of course, it's just distribution. That's all we're going to do. So, all right, let's see what happens. 2, 3 in base 6, 1, 5 in base 6, but remember, these are going to be in base 6. What is 3 times 5? 15. But what is 15 in base 6? Okay, 15 would be 2, yeah, the carry part would be 2 sixes, right, which is 12, with 3. So a 3 goes here, and I would have a 2 up there. Now, what is 5 times 2? 10. But what is 10 in base 6? Wait, sorry, 10. Plus 2, because I had my carry taken care of, which is 12. What is 12 in base 6? Two sixes with 0. So this is actually 2, comma 0, comma 3. And then we go back and we ignore the 2, right? Because that's been already sucked up. And now we do the other distribution. What's well, 1 times 3? But there's a 0 here, obviously, because that's position, right? They're still at zero. That's that factor out of 10. All right. What's 1 times 3? Three? 3 in base 6 is still 3. What's 1 times 2? Two? 2. That's still 2 in base 6. And then what do I do? Add. 3 plus 0 is 3. 0 plus 3 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 4. None of those carry over. So it's a 4, 3, 3 in base 6. Same process. There's nothing new here. But what's the most difficult part? Oh, man, sizes of six. <laughs> it's like, especially when you had 15. All right, 15, all right. Five and base six times three and base six is 
15, right, base 6, that's 15, and 15 is two sixes with three left over, so it has to be a 2, 3, and base 6. When in doubt, write it. You know, that's why that 2 went over there and that 3 went there, right? When in doubt, just write it out. So what is this in base 6? What is this in base 6? Have some scratch paper. Go back to the way you thought as a kid when you were first learning this algorithm in base 10. But in the end, it's just distribution. Can you see why this technique, though, is taught? It's very efficient and very quick. It's a clean way of writing the distribution. On the other hand, what I just said is, you know, you did base 10, you know, distribution and addition and things like that. Uh, one of the things I disagree with Common Core right now is they said, well, but this is the reason why. And so they try to teach the kids, all right, we're going to do the lattice method to do the distribution, right? And then we're going to add up the diagonals. We're going to do all these things because it's actually distribution. The hard part is you, it's better when you first learn things to be given the algorithm as a process and get the numbers. And then once you do enough of it, you get some number sense. And when you get some number sense, you can start to ask why. Why is this working? What's going on? There's always kind of a, a process of, of doing things as an approach. But one of the reasons why I have to say that is most likely you're going to run into people asking you, why? If you're taking a math class, why does that work? What's the slide and divide method of, of factoring? Why does it work? And it's a lot of times the answer, even for the teachers, is I have no idea, which is scary. Right. So, anyways, so we can do the algorithms. Now, for the last algorithm we're going to talk about, we can convert bases. We can add, once we have them in the figure base B, we can add the figures, we can multiply the figures, and understand that these are actually numbers in the background. And we can, even though I have that, I mean, I don't have any common sense concept of how big is that. What's 433 in base 6? Could you? Give me that in pennies. You know, I would have a hard time because I don't visualize it, right? We, I'd take it to base ten to be able to visualize it. But it doesn't matter if you had your culture grew up in base six, you would understand that. Is there a way to estimate something like that just by knowing the base? Yeah, roughly. I mean, if you wanted to get into a quick base ten without doing it the hard way, you would look at this and say, well, what if I had four, three, three in base six? What is this in base ten? Well, that's four. 36 is plus 36 is plus 3, right? You just quickly do it that way. And if you wanted to estimate it, you know, 436 is, is about 150, and that's an 18 and the 3, which is about 170-ish, right? You would simply say it's about that. It's not exact. Do that, and you would find out exactly what it is in base 10. So. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we constantly go into base 10. You have to have one system that we all agree upon to do as your standard. And it gets confusing when we don't. You know, think about the difference between miles and kilometers. If somebody's constantly telling you, you need to go 70 kilometers per hour. All right, how fast is that? Is that fast? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, because we don't, I mean, if you always drive in miles per hour, if somebody gives you a different, you know, idea of, of its quantification, we have a different metric. So we normally pick things just like people pick in science. Why do we pick metric system? Basically, you know, powers of ten. You know, things work out pretty well. Okay. On the other hand, why do we do miles? Yeah, this is what we've always done, right? And do they do the same thing? Yeah. So what about base systems? You know, why do you think the Babylonians had base sixty? I mean, think about that. You know, just in terms of their arithmetic. You know, you'd have to have 60 ways of writing unique symbols. <coughs> Why base 18? You know, some cultures had 18, some had 20. Some had a mixture of 18 and 20. Somebody had, you know, you kind of go through this, somehow are base 2. It's like, why would we pick one or the other? It's a kind of a good question. I mean, sometimes the anthropology, why did their culture do this? We don't know sometimes. If I had to guess for the Babylonians, the reason what I would guess on the Babylonians is that they really like to study astronomy. And if you do astronomy and you, you count things and look at things moving, they're big numbers. 
And base 60 allows you to use very few figures for very large numbers. That would be a guess. All right, last one. And this is a specific type of exponentiation that we'll have to think about, which is to take a number to the nth power modulo, say, m. Now, the book normally uses b, but we usually use b as the base, so I'll just go ahead and write this as a. How could I possibly do this if we're going to do this by hand? Now, normally, what's the order of operation? If I would do this by order of operations, what would you do first? A to the n equals, and you would find a big number, right? And then what would we, what would we do second? We would take that big number... And then finally do the mod m, right? All right. What we'll rather do is, if we would do this, creating big numbers is computationally. You don't have to do it, don't do it. Modulus of very big numbers is very expensive. So no matter what, if you had to do these things by hand, so if I had just to do something simple, what if I wanted to do, wanted to do, say, 2 to the 10th power, modulo 11. If I did it by operations, by the order of ops, right, what is that? What would we do first? What is 2 to the 10th, which is? Everybody should know that, right? Wait, 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 wait. No, it's not. I was thinking. Sorry. 2 to the 10th is a million. What's a thousand? Ten, 2 to the a kilo. 2, wait, is that right? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 9, 2, 9, 5, 12. Yeah, I was right. Jeez. 2 to the 20, all right, 2 to the 10th is, this is why they talk about a kilo bit, it's powers of 2. 2 to the 10th is the thing closest to 1,000. So actually, 1,024 is a kilo, is a kilo carry. When they say kilo bit, they don't mean 1,000. They mean 1,024. Okay, what's the nearest one? What power of 2 is the nearest to a million? It ends up being 2 to the 20th. What about a billion? 2 to the 30th. And so those are reasonable powers of 2 that are close, and so we actually use 2 to the 10, 2 to the 20, 2 to the 30 as the actual word, kilo, mega, giga, right? It doesn't mean thou, actual thousand, right? It's power of 2 close, and so, but they use the same word as what we actually use in metric systems as kilos, a thousand, not in computers. It's a thousand twenty-four. <laughs> but it's the same, I know, but that's just us. You better understand, right? All right, if I would have to do this, and then the second thing we would do would be, what is 1,024 modulo 11? So, okay, well, all right, what's, what is the nearest multiple of 11 to 1,024? Subtract that, and I would get my remainder, right? Now, could you see how this would be expensive if I would go up into 2 to the 20th, 2 to the 30th, 2 to the 5 billionth? All right, that gets expensive. You know, that's a little bit costly. But on the other hand, if I would use this, a times B mod M is simply A mod M times B mod M and then go mod M, which simply says modulus goes through multiplication. All right, if modulus goes through multiplication and I say that I have 2 to the 10th mod 11, all right, I could use that fact to make my life a little bit easier. All right, one, this is an approach where we would just simply do the following. Uh, 2 to the 10th is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? Mod 11. And so what I could do is just simply do this on a loop 11 times. Uh, what's 2 mod 11? All right, fine. What is 2 times 2 mod 11? 4. All right, what's 2 times 2 times 2 mod 11? 8, so it's still 8. What is 2 times 2 times 2 mod 11? All right, what's 2? That's 16. But what would be 16 mod 11? Back to 5, right? Oh, okay. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 actually is what? 
5. Well, now I can actually cheat. There's one, two, three, there's another group there. So what must they be? 5. But what's 5 times 5? 25. And what's 25 mod 11? 3. So that tells me that all of this, which is 25, but 25 mod 11 is actually 3. So all of that is actually what? 3. And okay, what's 3 times 2? 6. What's 6 times 2? Mod 11. 1. Whoops. Just group. <laughs> Keep multiplying. Oh, it's bigger than 11. Shrink it. Multiply. Bigger than 11. Shrink it. So this is how you could do it by hand, right? You would just simply multiply. Oh, it's too big. Shrink. Too big. Shrink. You just keep, oh, now I have that's a 5 and that's a 5. That's a 25. Well, that's actually 3. So let's just call the entire thing 3 because that's what it is. That's what it's congruent to. So we're just using this congruency. We're replacing things with what they're the same as. Just keep going down and keep, what's the modulus? What's the modulus? So I don't have to do what's 1024 mod 11. Which actually, tell, what does that tell you about 1023? It's a multiple of 11. Right? Because if the remainder is 1, that means the guy in front of him has to be a multiple of 11. So, everybody get that idea? Now, how can I do this as an algorithm? All right, there's two approaches to this. One, whatever the power is, just loop that many times. Times 2 mod 11, multiply by 2 mod 11, multiply by 2 mod 11, multiply by 2 mod 11, just loop 10 times. Right, that's one approach to this. The second approach is try to do it like what I did. Block grouping. We're going to try to do this in block grouping. And the way that we can do this is to say to use the following property. What if I want to find a to the nth power modulo m? And I would like to group a in, in good sizes such that, oh look, I know how, I know four A's are actually five. That means eight A's are five squared, which is just my previous answer squared, and I would get an answer of three, right? But what would that tell you about 16 twos? If four twos return to five, then eight twos would return five squared, which is actually three. But then what would 16 twos return? Well, that's an 8 and an 8. So that's a 3 and a 3, which is actually 3 squared, which is 9, which would return 9. Well, then what would 32 twos do? Sorry, not 32. Let's go to 16. I was at 8, right? 16 would be 8 and 8, which is actually 9 and 9. So it would be, well, what's 9 squared? 81, and then we take the modulus and it would go down, right? So that's how we're going to go through this problem, is how do we actually work this out? So the first thing that we do is to say, all right, fine, what is n in groups of two? But that would mean who of the figure numbers keeps track of groups of two? Base two, right? If I would return this in base 2, say this is a0, a1, now let's just do up to a2. This just is an example. Let's just go up to a2. Normally we'd go up to ak. What does that really mean? That means I have a2, 2 squareds, a1, 2s, and a0, right? Now, what are each of these A's? Since this is base 2, the AIs are what? What are all the... How many symbols do we need? We're either going to have 0 or we're going to have 1, right? Why are the decimal numbers called decimals? Why is 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9 called the decimals? Because they are the deci base tens. 
the binaries, 0 and 1, is base 2s. It's either a 0 or a 1. All right. What does a to the nth then mean? a to the nth means that this is a times a2 2 squared plus oops not plus yet plus up above plus a1 times 2 to the 1 plus a0 is everybody okay with that? that expansion of n what's addition of powers? It's multiplication of the bases. What is multiplication of powers? Exponentiation of the base, right? So what is this really? Mathematically, what this really is, is a to the fourth to the a2 times a squared to the a1 times a to the 1, a0. And then eventually, I'm just going to simply take the mod of that. I'm going to take this a to the fourth to the a2 times a squared to the a2 times a to the 1. So that was supposed to be a1. a1 times a to the a0 mod m. What does modulus do? It goes through everything. So I could find, what could we do? We could ask, what is A mod M? Then could I find this number? What's that number going to be? This squared, and then take mod M, and it's going to be that number. Well, then how do I find that one? That's a squared squared. So I'll take that number, square it, mod m. And it'll tell me what that base is. Now, what are all these numbers here? They're 0 or they're 1. What if it's a 0? What happens to the number? It's 1. It's gone. It's just the multiplicative identity. What if it's a 1? It's part of my answer. So what is the algorithm that's in the book? The algorithm that's in the book is to go through this process. We would just simply go through the bases. We're going to have this and square it and square it and square it. And it constantly tells us what that next base is. And then what do we do? We look at the power. If it's a 1, it affects your answer. If it's a 0, your answer doesn't change. Go to the next. Is it a 1? It affects your answer. Is it a 0? doesn't change your answer. Your answer stays the same. And so we have an if statement on this particular loop. And so the way this works is, let's use their, um, <coughs> so what do they do? They do b to the n mod m. This is page 254. What does this algorithm do? All right, the first thing that the algorithm does is you simply assume that we're given. So step one is n has to be some ak. They use ak minus one, I say call it a. It doesn't matter, right? a1, a0, base two. I need the base two expansion. I need the base two expansion. So we assume that we found it or we've been given it. All right, the second thing we have is that the answer is simply 1. We'll just assume that. And we're going to change the answer as we go along. And then we have to keep track of the bases. All right, the book, they say power. The power is equal to B mod M. That is this guy right here, right? That's that first one. That's... I do it at least once. And so what they're doing is they're calling these insides, they're calling these insides power. I would have rather called the insides uh, bases because they change, right? It's the bases that are going through the process. And then we loop. 
we loop on A0, A1, A2, all the way up to AK. Right? We just take care of each of these numbers one at a time. <clears throat> and then all we have to do is our answer changes. If the A sub I you're working with is 1, your answer is equal to your old answer. times the power mod m. We at least do that once, and then we always, so that's the first thing that we always do. The second thing we always do is to simply, we have to change the base, which is power is equal to power squared mod m. And that's what we loop on. Find the next base. And then we loop. Okay, do I need it? If the answer is yes, it's my old answer times the new thing, and that changes. If I don't need it, don't worry about it. Find the next base. So we're always finding the next base no matter what. This first part just simply says, do you, do you actually need it? And we just loop through all of the powers of the expansion, all the zero ones of the power of n. And that's what all that thing does. It, it works better if you write this in, not the way they wrote it, but you would write it in a table like a spreadsheet. Right, this is my ends, write them down, write your expansion vertically on the left, and then go on the right, and you write it in a spreadsheet form, and it works out pretty well. So, all right, that's it. Attendance. Will be... We're going to go ahead again. We're going to do theorem number three on page 260, which is there are infinitely many primes. All right, that's it.